The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the third chapter. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able to from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with an, anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, Are, And we? What should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with the water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. These past several months have been filled with um, all kinds of people making all kinds of claims. Whether one is watching the 24-hour news cycle or the local news or even Facebook or any number of other places, there are people who are doing something that has become, I guess, typical. There are inflammatory comments coming from all quarters hurled at us, if you will. These inflammations rile up the community, rile up a crowd of believers. Ellen Langer writes and refers to human beings as hypothesis-confirming organisms. hypothesis confirming organisms. What she means is that the human pattern is to come up with a hypothesis, a view of how things are, and then to go out and look around and gather evidence that confirms that hypothesis. And in the meantime, ignoring all the other th data that may go another way. And so in the middle of that data collection, it is easier when others are consistently supporting that hypothesis, often by hurling inflammatory quotes and quibbles. And those quotes and quibbles are often out of context. Lacking the fuller context, the situation, or the time in history, or the choices that are available, or who the people are, or even in the larger story, the literary context. Well, that fuller context often tells a more robust story. Too often, though, the context messes with those assumed hypotheses the expected outcome. Life is not so simple. If people are getting riled up over simple explanations, it is possible that they don't have the whole story. 
so too the story of John. John, we heard, started out last week as the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Recall that his ministry had a very particular time and a very particular place, and Luke, the author, wanted to make sure that we were clear about that that John was situated pretty clearly in that 27th or 28th year of the Common Era. That John was situated in a time when Caesar was ruling over all the known world. A time when Caesar had appointed harsh governors throughout the land. A time when even the religious leaders had worked their deals with the government so that they could practice their faith the way they wanted to. In fact, the empire kind of protected those practices. John comes into view as a voice of one who is crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He is in fact, offering a compelling message. People are flocking to him out in the wilderness, gathering around him, hoping for a glimpse of this thing to come. John's ministry is attractive. As is the case with such ministries, the crowd includes good, faithful, devout people who are seeking a word of hope. And in that hope and salvation, there is a particular truth that many of them experience the time and the place as particularly crushing because of the social situation, the history of that place, and the economic circumstances that surround them. The economic environment assumed that there was a finite, a fixed good available. In other words, if there is a pie and everybody gets their fair slice, if somebody gets a larger slice, then somebody else had to give up theirs. The assumption was that those who had more had it on the backs of somebody else. And that pattern was intensified by an economic system that encouraged extortion. As is the case in modern times, most people want to be fair and honest. But being fair and honest, well, it's a slow road to wealth. So when people saw others getting wealthier, faster, they suspected that they were to be scorned. Luke's telling of the story is colored by this understanding of the way the world is, is created and functioned. And yet people came out into this wilderness. A wilderness is a, a dangerous and scary place, a place where people die, where people run into bandits, where people are put at risk, and people were coming out to see John, to see and hear this word. Who are these people? Well, as recently as Thursday, I was making an argument that there were Gentiles among these people, outsiders. That those soldiers that we hear about are indeed Roman soldiers who are gathered and not Jewish. Then I come across literature that suggests that indeed in order to make the empire work, there were Jewish people who became a part of the, the military, the occupation force. These are people who would have served, even as though they were Jews, served as part of the empire's army. Now these people, one might suspect, are seen as being at least collaborators, if not traitors, and, and certainly people to be scorned and, 
and despised. And yet, is it possible that they are good, faithful people just trying to do what's necessary to get by? Who else? There are those tax collectors. They find themselves in a similar situation. Now, it would take a long time to fully describe how that taxation system worked. In many ways, it was messy. But let's suffice it to say that there were the chief tax collectors, and what they did was they paid the tax in advance for their whole area of responsibility. And then they marshaled a team of tax collectors to go out and collect what they had already paid. And they paid those folks, but not so much. And if they could extort or scare or rough people up to get a little bit more, then most of that went to the chief tax collector and not with the tax collectors themselves. But even still, they were conspiring with a, what was seen as a corrupt system. So you have these soldiers who would who would pad their, their meager wages through extortion. You had these tax collectors. Then you had all these other people, all these other people who were just living on the edge. These people who knew that to get by, sometimes people had to cheat. It's in the midst of this that John comes out and speaks. Now it seems like a bit of an oddity that on the day that we hear Zephaniah saying, Rejoice, your debts are paid, it's all good. And on this day when we hear Paul saying to the people in Philippi, Rejoice always that we hear John going out into the wilderness with his message. And how does his message begin? You snakes. More than that, and though we joke about it in our staff Bible study, um, these, let's just say these snakes have questionable um, lineage. You snakes, who told you to come out here and receive this baptism for repentance? Do you think that you're going to get off easy because of that? And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, but Abraham is my ancestor, so I'm golden, I'm covered. But in reality, I tell you, bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. Because if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut off. Rejoice. And in fact, these people heard the message and they said, what should we do? And to the, to the average folks, he said, well, if you've got more than one coat and you know somebody who doesn't have one, share that extra coat. And if you have more food than you need and you know somebody who's going hungry, make sure that you feed them too. What John the Baptist calls them to, the fruit worthy of repentance is a fruit of loving God and loving your neighbor and living that out more fully. He doesn't give pie-in-the-sky sermons, not the kind of gentle stuff that you might get from a Lutheran pastor in the 21st century. He comes in hard-hitting, but he comes back with clear, practical things to do. If you're doing well and you know somebody who needs, care for them, love them, show them God's love. And then these these tax collectors say, what should we do? And he says, well, don't collect more tax than you're supposed to. Don't go extorting more. 
And the soldiers say, what, 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 are, what, are, what are we supposed to do? Don't be supplementing your wages by roughing people up. And all these people heard this as something that was, was new and different and, and full of good news for them. And they thought just maybe this could be the Messiah himself. John says, no, 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 don't be mistaken. I come baptizing with water, but one who is following me he comes with the real deal, with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so when you live out this love and when you bear fruit that is worthy of repentance and when you live into the fullness of what God is already doing in our midst, then we see the hope that you came out here for. The 21st century is its own kind of scary place, its own kind of scary time. And indeed, the media and our world is full of lots of scary things to hear. And yet, in the midst of it all, God's people gather around to hear a word of hope and hear a call call to repentance, but more so a call to bear fruit that is worthy of repentance, to live the kind of love that God has already shown to the people of God, a love that is grounded in forgiveness and compassion and ensuring that everybody has what they need. John's call is a call not just to that people in that time, but also a call to this people in this time to work for God's commitment that is already embodied in Jesus Christ, a commitment to life and well-being for all people.